Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss the next inevitable phase of Brexit. After initially denying that Brexit was even causing problems, Brexit commentators, especially in the media, are now turning to reporting on the chaos caused by Brexit because it's undeniable. There was going to come a point where it was undeniable, uh, so they have to report on it. But of course, they have to then lay the blame at someone else. So the obvious culprit is going to be the government's implementation. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So we've had predictably a little bit of a change in tune from some Brexit commentators of late. Nigel Farage, the man that Graham Hughes calls the foghorn of ignorance, which I rather like, was saying that the best test of a good Brexit deal would be how it treats the fishing industry. Last month, he said that he supports this Brexit deal. He said he'd have preferred a no deal, but he said that this is a good deal. Now, that fishing industry is on its ass. Nigel Farage seems to have gone missing. I, I think we might need to contact the police. He seems to be AWOL. It's not actually true. At least his Brexit rhetoric is missing. He is about, he's still got things to say. He's trying to poke at COVID at the moment. Oh, and, and continuing to support Donald Trump. He's still on that bandwagon, which tells you all you need to know about this particular piece of human flotsam. He has also recently taken to complaining about lockdown restrictions. And then on his timeline, complaining about people not following the lockdown restrictions. But that's okay because the people he was complaining about have brown skin. So he wasn't being hypocritical, was he? Apparently. But seriously, his comments on the fishing industry, where, 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 where have they gone? Then we had the Daily Express, very pro-Brexit paper for those who don't know, had this headline. Scrap it now. Boris Johnson urged to tear up Brexit fishing agreement with EU according to some poll they have. Done. The only slight flaw in this plan, actually I can think of a few flaws, but the biggest flaw I have in this plan is that we, we don't have a fishing agreement with the EU. Where's this fishing agreement they want us to tear up? Doesn't seem to exist. We have a trade and cooperation agreement. Are they suggesting we tear that up? It includes some sections on fishing. I don't actually know the legal position I have to say. It might actually be possible. You know, because the treaty hasn't been ratified by the EU. In, in fact, it's not going to be ratified by the EU for a few months now. They've had to extend it because it takes some time to do it properly. I mean, we didn't do it properly. That was, that was a problem, you see. Uh, that was another thing that occurred in Parliament this week. We had uh, a, a Brexiteer Tory MP complaining that there's now less parliamentary scrutiny over our trade deals after Brexit than there was when we were EU members. Yeah. Do you know why that is? That's because the EU are open about their dealings. Everyone can find out what's going on. Nothing behind closed doors. Well, you have discussions behind closed doors, but everything that's agreed is published. Everything. Parliaments, the EU Parliament, are going to have to ratify this deal. They're not, they're not rushing it through in a day. They want, they want a few months to get it all translated and to properly consider it. They've got committee stages. They need to discuss it. I've little doubt they'll ratify it because at the end of the day, they got what they wanted. But they're going to go through the process. Whereas this particular Brexiteer MP, just like all his mates, decided to give the government a completely blank check. They voted to allow the government to conduct their trade agreements however they like without having to refer to Parliament. So there we go. A little aside there. Um, but the, what I was trying to say is, because they haven't ratified it, the whole thing hasn't yet become an international treaty. As I, I'm not an expert in these things. I don't know. Does that mean that we could, in theory, scrap it before they've ratified it? Maybe, maybe. Uh, but the thing is, the, the problems that the fishing industry is facing right now, like I keep trying to explain, and, and I accept that it could be confusing for some people because you've got people on the hard Brexit side saying the problems are caused by the Brexit deal. But unfortunately, you also have some people on the rejoin side saying the same thing, which is ridiculous. It's nothing to do with the deal. If we didn't have the deal, those same fishermen would be facing exactly the same problems, only that of a whole host of other problems as well. Because some fishermen can get their fish to market on the EU, a bit delayed, but they can get them there, some of them anyway. But if we didn't have a deal, they'd have those same barriers, might have some more barriers, because actually the EU have done us a bit of a solid. You might think it's really bad now, but they've actually, you know, they've been a bit kind with us. In a no deal scenario, the checks would be much harsher. So actually, no, it would be worse from that point of view, not just the same. But 
what I was trying to say is there'd also be tariffs slapped on it as well. So by the time those fish got to market, delayed, not as fresh, more expensive as well. Not going to sell very many like that, are you? So that's what would happen if we actually did rip up the treaty. So not only would those fishermen, and it's not like it'd be a net downside to the fishing industry. There would be no benefit because this deal does no harm to the fishing industry. This is the point I keep trying to make. What's done the harm is exiting the customs union in a single market. That's what's done the harm. The deal hasn't saved them. Should we put it that way? The deal doesn't save the Brexit fishing industry. Did I say Brexit fishing industry? I actually meant British fishing industry. <laughs> Same thing really though, I suppose, at the moment. Now, can you imagine what these fishermen would be thinking if they're reading a headline like that? Fair number of them must read the Daily Express. They're thinking, hang on a minute, the Daily Express wants us to tear up the agreement. Good God, no. I'm already looking at bankruptcy. It'll be making it certain if that happened. Could you imagine that? Just as well, though, that fortunately the Daily Express doesn't get to dictate government policy because that would be enough to give them a heart attack. And quite frankly, you know, the last thing our hospitals need at the moment is a load of fishermen with heart attacks. But um, then there's the Daily Mail timeline. That's quite interesting. Daily Mail timeline. 31st of December 2020, Britain breaks free of EU rules. 7th of January, British companies give up on cross-channel trade because of Brexit red tape. 14th of January, potato farmers flying workers from the Philippines to stop crops rotting in fields after Brexit. 15th of January, government could scrap 48-hour weekly, 48-hour uh, working week and holiday post-Brexit. 17th of January, shoppers hit by delays and extra fees on items shipped from the EU. 19th of January, Theresa May blasts Boris's moral failure. Everything's going well then, is it? Is it? Everything's going well. All started so optimistically and in a few weeks it's all gone to hell. I have to say I'm a little bit confused though because shouldn't we be hearing about all the benefits of Brexit by now? I mean, if you saw those headlines in The Guardian or, you know, a sensible newspaper that knew Brexit was a load of rubbish, you'd just go, oh, well, you know, well, it didn't like Brexit in the first place. This is the Daily Mail. This is pro-Brexit. Pro-hard -pro Brexit as well. You know, it's not like, say, the Telegraph. Now, the Telegraph I'll give a little bit of credit to because last year they were calling for an extension to the transition period. You know, they're Brexit supporting but they weren't hard Brexit supporting. But the Daily Mail were, just like the Daily Express. You know, the thing is, you know, before Brexit, I kept being told, just, you'll see, Phil, just wait. Once we've left the EU properly, then last year we've left the EU now. No, properly, like, we've got to leave the customs union single market. Then you'll see. I, I have to say, all I'm seeing is downsides at the moment, I've got to say. Trade between Britain and the EU is way down. Uh, trade between Britain and Northern Ireland is facing a calamity. Shelves are empty of certain products again. Worse in Northern Ireland. Some products can't be exported or imported at all. Quite a lot of businesses are going to the wall. Some are trying to survive, but they don't know how. Jobs are being lost. Whole communities are at risk of economic ruin because whole communities are dependent on a particular trade that is just, at the moment, zero, gone. Now we've got Roger Daltrey, one of the few in the music industry who championed Brexit, now complaining about it. What was it the uh, Brexit supporters called us? Remoaners? Because we were moaning about Brexit? Now the Brexit supporters, supporters are moaning about Brexit more than those who never wanted to leave. Or maybe it just seems like they're complaining more loudly because the, medium give, the media give them a, a more airtime. So maybe they've just got the megaphone to make it sound louder. But there's also been the rather specific backlash to Brexit in the county of Kent which is not only host to Nigel Farage, but also all the lorry parks that this work has necessitated. So, and this isn't a new protest, of course. It's, it began as soon as the construction began. Now, I've got mixed views on this, I have to say. On the one hand, Kent voted largely for Brexit. They also, more importantly, voted Conservative in the last general election. And the last general election votes were far more crucial in getting this sort of Brexit because you could sort of understand the people in 2016 vote for Brexit because they were promised that we'd remain in the single market but in 2019 if you voted conservative you knew we were leaving 
you voted to leave the single market. Now, of course, it was a minority that voted for that, but nonetheless, they made that choice and a lot of people in Kent did that. They sent to Parliament a load of MPs who brought them the outcome that necessitates the lorry parks. And if you accept that we had to leave the customs union single market, and if you voted Tory, you did, then you have to accept that we need the lorry parks. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine that the people of Kent would prefer those thousands of lorries to be backed up on their roads, because if the lorry parks weren't there, that's where they would be, stuck on the roads, making travel across the whole county all but impossible. On the other hand, not everyone who lives in Kent was either for Brexit or the Conservatives. In addition, construction began on these lorry parks without any of the normal procedures being followed. No public consultation, no serious involvement even with local government. A load of signs were put up one day and a load of JCBs turned up the next. That seemed to be about as much notice as people got. So although I have no sympathy for Brexit and Tory voters who enabled this, and I reject completely any notion that it's not what they voted for, it's exactly what they voted for, they voted to leave the customs union. That means they voted for checks at the ports in their county. That means they voted for delays in order to carry those checks out. That means they voted for someone to put the lorries somewhere for them to wait. And that means they voted for the lorry parks. At best, any Brexit supporters in on this protest action are NIMBY activists who are, and I never have any sympathy for those sort of people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I can quite see we should have the lorry parks. Yes, yes, of course. Just, just not where I can see them somewhere else really piss off but although i have no sympathy for the bulk of people suffering the effects of their own repeated mistakes at the ballot box which most will still repeat in future elections let's face facts they'll still vote the tories in next time that doesn't mean that they deserve to be treated in this way still because the parks although they would have had to have been built and although local objections shouldn't hold sway if all they've got is moaning, NIMBY moaning, I've, I'm no interest in NIMBY politics. If they've got no better ideas for why it should be built somewhere else, bug here, but they should still have been involved. And so too should local government. Because perhaps there would have been somewhere better. Perhaps they could have pointed out, you seem to be trying to build that lorry park on a floodplain. Oh, it's raining. Oh, it's flooded. Who'd have thought it? But an apologies to any Remainers in the protest group in Kent. All I see is another example of Brexiteers moaning about Brexit. I saw a report about these protesters. Um, there was a line that the, the news of the construction of a new one coming came as a complete shock to the residents. That this news came in on New Year's Eve. I get a shock, really? At this point, several sites had already begun construction in Kent for months. They'd been there for months. How big of a shock was it really if you were a resident of Kent and you lived to a, next to a bloody big field after months of other bloody big fields been turned into lorry parks, how much of a shock was it really that your bloody big field was being turned into a lorry park? So with a whole host of Brexit commentators now complaining about Brexit or like Nigel Farage finding something else to complain about laying low on Brexit for a bit, it will be interesting to see how they behave when Brexit gets much worse, because this is just the start, really. And sure, there are some consequences that will drip so slowly that many won't notice. But I keep coming back to this. Businesses that could stockpile for January, come February or even the end of January next week, our level of trade is either going to have to dramatically increase or our economic activity will dramatically diminish. The time leading up to spring is going to be fascinating. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.